The year is 1982. The Commodore 64, the Atari 5200, the Astrocade, the Vectrex, the ZX Spectrum, and the ColecoVision were all released that year. But 1982 would also mark the beginning of the digital revolution with the commercial introduction of the compact disc, CDs. Jointly developed by Sony and Philips, CDs promised an end to the various headaches of cassette tapes. Side switching, rewinding, low quality analog recordings, and fragile tape were things of the past now that CDs were here, they said. While they didn't catch on immediately due to the extreme expense of first generation CD players, as the prices of players went down, the adoption rate of CDs went up. By 1988, 400 million CDs were being pressed per year. The joint Sony and Philips team continued developing compact disc specifications after 1982, with the CD-ROM format, also known as Yellow Book, being ratified in 1988. The introduction of audio CDs to the music industry was great, but the impact CD-ROMs would have on the computer industry would be many times larger, because while you could still achieve great sound using other media and high-end equipment in the 80s, there was nothing to rival compact discs in the world of computing when they were first introduced. Before CD-ROMs, the prominent sources of computer software and games were floppy disks and cassette tapes, and 3.5 inch floppy disks would reach their famous 1.44 megabyte limit in 1986. CD-ROMs, on the other hand, could hold over 630 megabytes. Today, that means very little, when games come on Blu-ray discs and can take over 20 gigabytes of space to install. But in 1988, a 30-megabyte hard drive could cost $300 by itself. CD-ROMs offered such a huge leap in storage capacity that they completely changed the way software and game designers created their products. Before CD-ROMs, efficiency was king. You had to make your game fit on as few floppy disks as possible because they each cost money to produce, they added weight to shipping costs, they contained moving parts, and since many computers still didn't have hard drives at all, consumers would be stuck swapping disks to use your product. Thin, simple, cheap, compact disks solved all of these problems, at least once CD-ROM drives became common on computers in the early 90s. So for some of us 80s kids, our first taste of CD-ROM technology would come from video games. The first CD-ROM capable game console was the TurboGrafx-16 CD, released in Japan as the PC Engine. However, the TurboGrafx didn't do as well here in the US as it did in Japan. That brings us to the topic of today's video, the Sega CD, released in Japan in 1991 as the Mega CD. It was designed by Sega of Japan in association with Sony. When most people bring up the Sega CD, it's to bash it. The Sega CD was not a commercial success story, and it was plagued by the same problems all early CD games suffered from. But I liked the Sega CD. I owned one for a brief time as a child, and I thought it was amazing. That's why I took the time to bring you back to the era, so that you can keep its downsides in perspective. The Super Nintendo had only been out for a year by the time the Sega CD was released in America, so Sega was ahead of the game a little bit, or so they thought. I may like the Sega CD, but technology limitations of the time and some bizarre executive decisions kept it from changing the world of gaming as Sega of America promised it would. The Sega CD was absolutely a gamble, but something had to be done. The NES was still extremely popular in Japan and the US, despite its age, so Nintendo was not in a hurry to release a new console. NEC released the PC Engine in Japan in 1987 as the first 16-bit home console, and its bright color palettes won over the Japanese. When the Mega Drive released in Japan in 1988, it was met with a lukewarm reception. It did not sell as well as expected, and this was mostly attributed to the average quality of the early titles, which did not show off the full capabilities of the Mega Drive's powerful hardware. The ultimate result was that, in Japan, the Mega Drive ended up in a distant third place in the 16-bit console era after the release of the Super Famicom. And this is important because it explains, to a point, Sega of Japan's strange decisions with the Sega CD. In the US, the TurboGrafx-16 was not very popular at all, and Sega of America's wise decision to pack Sonic the Hedgehog with the Genesis 
helped it to become the must-have system in 1989 and 1990. Sega of America also convinced Sega of Japan to allow them to create American-centric marketing strategies and to work with developers to create games specific for the US market, and so the Genesis did very well here. Even with the release of the Super Nintendo on the horizon, Sega of America was fairly comfortable. They had a great system, and their newer 16-bit games were blowing the 8-bit NES games out of the water, so more and more kids were converting to Sega. Sega of Japan, on the other hand, was feeling rather desperate. The Super Famicom released in Japan in 1990, and despite having only two launch titles available, it sold out almost instantly. In fact, the sale caused such a ruckus that the Japanese government created a law that all future game console releases must take place on weekends so that they would not interfere with businesses. Just as today, technology was changing rapidly back then, and those two extra years of advancements meant that the Super Nintendo had more features, a larger color palette, and a much better sound chip than the Genesis. It could also make use of special chips embedded on the game carts themselves, like the Super FX chip, which was famously used with Star Fox. This was a feature that the Genesis lacked, with the exception of one game. The Genesis game Virtual Racing was the only game to ever use an extra chip, called the Sega Virtual Processor, which functioned similarly to the Super FX chip in allowing rendering of 3D polygons. However, this chip was so expensive to produce that Virtual Racing retailed for an absurd $100 when it was released in October 1992. This meant that the only real way for Genesis games to make use of new technology was with console add-ons, and the Mega CD was Sega of Japan's answer to this problem. The success of the PC Engine and its CD add-on in Japan only solidified their confidence in this new technology. The PC Engine was released in Japan in 1987 to compete with Nintendo's 8-bit Famicom system, and it, because it was the first 16-bit console, its graphics and audio advantages garnered it many fans. But it was after the release of the PC Engine CD add-on that the console really took off. Sega saw this and thought that they could duplicate that success. But for some boneheaded reason, Sega of Japan decided to keep the Mega CD's development a close secret. So close, in fact, that they didn't even allow Sega of America or Sega of Europe in on the action. Sega of Japan would not release any details of the add-on to its overseas branches until a few months before its Japanese launch. They did reveal that they were working on an add-on and that it was CD-based, but that was it. Sega of America and Europe were left completely in the dark as to its exact hardware specifications or even its design goals. When the Super Nintendo was announced in the US, Sega of America countered with news of the new CD add-on for the Genesis touting it as a huge leap forward, and that it could even be considered a whole new console, not just an add-on for the Genesis, but an evolution. Clearly, that is not what the Sega CD was. But because Sega of Japan withheld all relevant information, Sega of America chose to boast, and overstating the capabilities of the add-on was the first problem the Sega CD encountered outside of Japan. Sega of America did not even get a working prototype until after the Japanese Mega CD was pretty much finalized, and they had to piece it together themselves. This completely negated the benefits of region-specific campaigns and game development that the international branches had going at the time. Even worse, this secretive development meant that Sega only released development kits to third-party developers shortly before the Mega CD was released. There were only two games available when the system launched in Japan, and one of them was just a Mega Drive game with some Redbook audio added. As a result, the Sega CD's game library would grow slowly, and it would include many strange and new kinds of games because, quite simply, CD-ROM games were new, and no one knew what to do with all that extra storage space besides add Redbook audio and horribly compressed video footage. As if these weren't bad enough, Two of the launch titles of the Sega CD in America were from the Make My Video series, including the infamous Marky Mark game. Yeah. So if the Sega CD wasn't intended to revolutionize gaming as we knew it, what was Sega of Japan's plan for it? 
The Sega CD's hardware offered a faster CPU and more RAM than the Genesis, improved audio support, and two extra graphics chips to add sprite scaling and rotation effects. But most games only made use of the audio upgrades the add-on provided, and if it weren't for Redbook Audio or video cutscenes, the majority of Sega CD games would look identical to Genesis games. This was intentional, simply because the technology of the time didn't allow for much else. TurboGrafx-16 CD games and early PC CD-ROM games were mostly the same way. All that the CD add-ons provided boiled down to games having extra space. The Mega CD's launch in Japan was mediocre, but initial sales of the Sega CD in the US and the Mega CD in the UK were very positive. Sega's then-large American fan base was not thrilled with the launch titles available, but they were confident that Sega would deliver better games in the future. How could they not? The Sega CD retailed for $300 when it launched, which was over $100 more than the Genesis itself. And with the boasting from the Western Sega branches, fans were convinced that this new technology was the future. The first Sega CD model was designed with the first Genesis model in mind, and it sat underneath the Genesis console. It had a slide-out disc tray that was accessed by pressing the reset button on the Genesis. The Model 1 Sega CD didn't have an eject button of its own. This is not the model people think of when they think of the Sega CD, however, as around the time this first model was released in Europe in 1993, Sega was putting the finishing touches on the second model of the Genesis and the Sega CD. The Model 2 Sega CD features a lift-up disc tray and it was more durable, plus it released at a price of $230, which was still very expensive but it was much easier to swallow than the Model 1's $300 price tag. There were some other consoles created that could play Sega CD games, such as the Sega CDX, also known as the Multimega. It's a combination Genesis and Sega CD, which also acts as a portable CD player. Only around 5,000 of these ever shipped to the US, and it retailed for $400, so functioning units are highly sought after. And with that, Let's talk about the games themselves. Like I said, the majority of Sega CD titles were not much advanced from regular Genesis games. There were several titles that appeared on both the Genesis and Sega CD, and even on the Super Nintendo. Some games featured more levels or bonus features, or animated or video cutscenes. Most of the worst games were the typical FMV games Although, as far as those go, I do have to make special mention of Sewer Shark, as it was a US Sega CD pack-in with the Model 2, and it was one of the earliest FMV games to grace a game console. I am not going to dwell on these FMV games, however. If you've seen the Nerd Sega CD episode, you know they're bad. Sewer Shark was one of the many FMV games created for the Sega CD by the company Digital Pictures, which also produced the games Night Trap, Double Switch, Ground Zero Texas, and several others. If you can look back at these FMV games and wonder, what were they thinking, you don't even know the half of it. Night Trap and Sewer Shark weren't even originally going to be Sega CD games. They were initially developed for the Control Vision, aka the Hasbro Nemo. You've never heard of it because it never came to be, but it was a game console that was going to use VHS tapes instead of cartridges or CDs. That's right video games on VHS tapes. After Digital Pictures created a few prototype games, Hasbro wisely decided to stop funding the Control Vision, and these games found their way to the Sega CD and other early CD consoles. I'm not saying Sewer Shark was a great game, but it was the first CD game I played, and it definitely left an impression on me. Yes, it's cheesy. Yes, it's corny. Yes, the video is horribly compressed. Yes, the acting is so over the top it's in the stratosphere, but as a 9 year old I thought this was the coolest thing since Mighty Max. Even back then, I think I knew it was streaming video and not an actual 3D world, but if you just shut off your brain and let yourself get immersed, it's a very convincing effect, especially when your vehicle turns. You'll notice that the quality of the video is quite poor, and that is often the first thing people bring up about the Sega CD, the cropped grainy videos. The reason the videos looked like that was because the Sega CD didn't actually provide any extra hardware specifically for decoding video. The MPEG-1 video encoding standard wasn't ratified until 1993, 
This means that the base genesis is actually serving up the videos itself. In other words, the video on Sega CD games is exactly what you would see if the video could possibly fit on a Genesis cartridge. The Sega CD's faster processor and extra RAM helped, but the video quality was restricted to what the Genesis could handle, and the Genesis had a smaller color palette than the Super Nintendo did. There were six games that also took advantage of the Sega 32X to increase video quality, but I'm not even going to go there. So apart from the FMV games and Genesis re-releases, what kind of games were there for the system? Around 140 titles were released for the Sega CD if you ignore regional variations, which is a decently sized library for a console add-on and it does offer a wide variety. The most well-known game has to be Sonic CD, not just because it's a Sonic game on a Sega platform, but because it's one of the best games on the system. Since it is so well known, I'm not going to say much about it other than to say that I was a huge Sonic fan, and Sonic CD, with its intro and awesome music, only made me love him more. I will say that I much prefer the American soundtrack versus the Japanese, European version. I know that the American one isn't the original, I just like it better. The most popular Sega CD series has to be the pair of games from Game Arts a Tokyo-based game company that became world famous in 1987 when Sierra released their game Thexter in the US for home computers. Sierra would publish more successful computer games from Game Arts, such as Sylphide and Zelliard, but it was for their Sega CD titles that Game Arts would become the most well-known. They began working on a role-playing game with a focus on storytelling and animation, and they created their own subsidiary studio to manage the project because this was a new genre for the company. This was not Game Art's first Mega CD game, and it was a labor of love, but schedule constraints forced them to leave out as much as a third of the total content they wanted to include in the game, so it was rushed to completion. It could have been a disaster, but luckily, Game Art's decided to name their game Lunar the Silver Star, and it turned out to be an incredible success. They released a sequel game, Lunar Eternal Blue, two years later, to equal fanfare and praise. Both of the Lunar titles were localized for the American market by Working Designs, which made the company famous. The Lunar games gave birth to Working Designs' reputation for localizing quality Japanese titles with care, respect, and a good sense of humor. The reception of the Lunar games in the US and Europe matched the Japanese reaction with many people considering the two games to not only be the two best RPGs on the Sega CD, but the best RPGs to ever grace a Sega console. Working designs would bring over more well-received Sega CD games, including Popful Mail. Popful Mail was an action RPG platformer with a cute anime style that was created by Falcom and originally released on Japanese home computers in 1991 and 92. Sega and Falcom then formed a partnership to rework the game for the PC Engine CD and the Mega CD. Falcom also then worked on its own to release a remake for the Super Famicom. Popful Mail is one of my favorite Sega CD games. It's bright and colorful and I love its style and personality. Gameplay wise it's equivalent to a Genesis game, but its soundtrack, voice acting and animations help set it apart. The Sega CD version of Popful Mail has a bit of a bizarre history, however, as it was initially developed as a Sonic the Hedgehog RPG called Sister Sonic, which would have starred Sonic's long-lost sister. The game would have been similar to the original computer versions of Popful Mail, but the characters and plot would have been replaced by Sonic characters, similar to the way Mario 2 was created. But when American gamers found out about this plan, they sent Sega so much mail begging for Popful Mail to be released unaltered that Sister Sonic was ultimately cancelled. Vei is your standard Japanese RPG of the time, also published for the West by Working Designs. Apart from the anime cutscenes and CD audio, it's your typical Genesis RPG. I have not played this game, so I can't recommend it personally, but it was re-released on the iPhone in 2008 and there are some bonus, unfinished animated cutscenes that you can watch if you beat the game. They were left out of the Sega CD version, and the president of Working Designs told players that if they got to the end of the game and entered a special cheat code, that they could view these unfinished cutscenes. However, the cheat code provided didn't work, 
so these cutscenes were considered lost until the iPhone re-release unlocked them 15 years later. The cult classic of the Sega CD that everyone brings up is Snatcher. Developed by Konami for Japanese home computers, with a development team that included a young Hideo Kojima, Snatcher was re-released and updated several times over its life. However, the only English version ever released came out for the Sega CD in 1994. Snatcher is a mature cyberpunk investigative visual novel type of game, and it drew much of its inspiration from movies such as Blade Runner, Akira, and The Terminator. It's not a twitchy action game, it's very dialogue heavy, with a methodical pace and occasional shooting sections. The genre, coupled with the dwindling support for the Sega CD by 1994, meant that Snatcher sold very poorly in the West, with most gamers only finding out about its greatness many years later. Snatcher was censored a bit for the Western markets as well, but it's not as major as you would think. Most of the changes involved cultural things, such as the 14 year old girl being changed to 18, and the editing of things that could be taken to be copyright infringements with Western intellectual properties. There were a couple of scenes depicting nudity which were censored, but the American version actually has more violence than the Japanese original. You have to be in the right mindset to play these kinds of games, and because of its rarity and popularity, Snatcher has fetched a hefty price ever since the Sega CD was discontinued. The Sega CD also had a couple of really great scrolling shooters. There's Lords of Thunder, which is a port from the TurboGrafx CD. It's a great looking, great playing fantasy shooter with a rockin' soundtrack, an in-game store to purchase power-ups, and non-linear level selection. It's the sequel to Gate of Thunder, which unfortunately was not ported to the Sega CD, so look to the Turbo CD for that game. A great Sega CD exclusive shooter is Robo Elaste, the final game in a series of Japanese vertical scrolling shooters. If you're familiar with the game Musha from the Sega Genesis, or Space Megaforce on the Super Nintendo, this is part of that same series. Robo Elast features great graphics and music and very nicely used CD audio for certain sound effects. The Sega CD game Silphied was created by Game Arts and released in 1993. It's a sort of remake of the original Silphied, which Game Arts released on Japanese home computers back in 1986. Because 1993 was also the year that Star Fox was released for the Super Nintendo, many people compared the two games even though they really shouldn't have. Silphied is unique because it's one of the only titles to render 3D polygons on the Genesis without the help of the 32X or the SVP chip. Game Arts actually made use of the Sega CD's faster processor in order to make this happen, something most Sega CD developers didn't bother with. However, Silphied is only a 2D shooter. It renders polygons for the game characters, but you can only move left and right, and the background is a pre-rendered video. It's still a fun game, but it does have some pretty annoying non-stop radio chatter. The TurboGrafx-16 system became famous for having tons of shoot-'em-ups, and games of a popular subgenre were called cute-'em-ups for their overly cute designs. One such game exclusive to the Sega CD is KEO Flying Squadron, released in 1994 and published by JVC. While it's not quite as bright and colorful as the Turbo Shooters, it's very detailed. It's one of the rarer US release Sega CD games, so it's quite expensive if you can find it. It's also noteworthy in Europe due to a bit of laziness on JVC's part. A game magazine named Sega Pro included a demo disc of KEO Flying Squadron in issue 3, and the game ended after you beat the first level. However, the disc actually included the entire game, so if you used a level select cheat code, you could begin the game on stage 2 and play the game through to the end. This demo disc is highly collectible as a result. A couple of well-regarded tactical RPGs for the Sega CD are Dark Wizard and Shining Force CD. Dark Wizard uses a hexagonal map system similar to the game Military Madness and I guess it's more of a strategy game than a role-playing game, but it does have level-up segments and a story to follow. In terms of gameplay, it's very simple and rather slow, however it has liberal amounts of animated cutscenes to introduce characters and to further the plot more than most other Sega CD games. It has four playable characters, each with slightly different stages, 
and some nice orchestral music. The game will plot along with frequent disc accesses, but this can be alleviated somewhat by disabling some graphics options. Shining Force CD is a remake of two Shining Force guiding games that were only released for the Sega Game Gear in Japan. The graphics and gameplay are nothing special. They were updated from the Game Gear originals to resemble the Genesis Shining Force games, and there's some CD music. It's one of the better rated games on the Sega CD, and it's pretty collectible due to its late 1994 release, but it also has a unique quirk. Shining Force CD contains four chapters. The first chapter is a remake of the first guiding game, and the second chapter is a remake of the second game. The third and fourth chapters are new stories created to extend the plot, but this is where the game runs into some trouble. Most RPGs of the time allowed you to save your progress directly to the game cart using a battery soldered to the game carts themselves. But you couldn't exactly put batteries on a CD, so early CD consoles had fixed internal memory. The Sega CD only had 8 kilobytes of memory available for saving games, however. This was late 1991 technology, remember? So here comes a 1994 RPG, Shining Force CD. You had to beat the first two chapters in order to unlock chapter 3, and then beat chapter 3 to unlock chapter 4. The problem was that the game checked for all three game saves before it would unlock chapter 4, and the three saves took so much memory that they could not all fit on the Sega CD's puny SRAM, even if this was the only game you used the save feature with. The only way to beat Chapter 3 and unlock Chapter 4 on real hardware was to purchase a Sega CD accessory, the CD Backup RAM cart. It was essentially a memory cart, the size of a Genesis game cartridge, for use with Sega CD game saves. This accessory cost $60, as much as a new game, and Shining Force CD cannot be completed without it. One of the more technically impressive games for the Sega CD was a fighting game called Eternal Champions Challenge from the Dark Side, a sequel to the Genesis fighter Eternal Champions. It's a very nice looking game with a very large roster including 9 hidden characters. It had plenty of violence and gore for the kids, as well as the usual litany of Mortal Kombat style fatality moves. But the game went a step further than Mortal Kombat with the Cinekill feature which were special fatalities that played out in FMV sequences. Sega hyped up Eternal Champions, and while it was a decent fighter, especially considering it was an original title and not an arcade port, it was released in 1995 when the Sega CD was at the end of its life. The Sega CD's library of 140 titles wasn't huge, but it contained several great games, and many of its better games were exclusive to the add-on or offered specific advantages over other console versions. For example, Final Fight CD was the definitive home port of Final Fight. The Super Nintendo had Final Fight as a launch title back in 1990, but several features were removed. The Sega CD version was not arcade perfect, but it restored most of what the Super Nintendo version left out. Guy was back, two player co-op was back, the industrial level was back, and Poison was once again a lady who could kick your butt. There was also the uh, Earthworm Jim Special Edition, which was available for the Sega CD and Windows 95. It had more animation frames and a CD soundtrack, as well as some extra levels compared to the other home console versions. The majority of the rest of the games are the typical cash-ins you'd find on any console, like sports games and puzzle games, plus your fair share of Laserdisc ports, like Dragon's Lair, Space Ace, Time Gal, and Road Avenger. Because of the poor video quality, you're almost always better off finding these games on later consoles, however. Of course, being a Japanese console, it had some interesting Japanese exclusives. One of the most popular Mega CD games was Urusei Yatsura, Dear My Friends, a well-animated and fully voiced point-and-click adventure game based on the anime. This game is one of the best examples of the Sega CD taking advantage of animation. Unfortunately, there is no chance of this game being fan translated because there is nothing to translate. Since everything is voiced, there is almost no text in the game at all, as there are no subtitles. The very last game published for the Mega CD in any region was the Japanese game Shadowrun in 1996, based on the role-playing system of the same name. Shadowrun fans will look at this cover art and think, man, look at this cutesy anime dreck. <laughs> 
they ruined Shadowrun. But if you look at the actual game, it's exactly what you would expect from the license. It's dark, gritty, and bloody. It is unique in the Shadowrun universe as it's based on the Japanese version of the pen and paper game, with the game taking place in Japan rather than a future Seattle. This has interesting effects on the game since, for example, orc control characters are unplayable because orcs and trolls have been forced into exile in Japan. I hope I've convinced you that the Sega CD was not a complete failure as many people like to call it. It certainly does not belong in the same boat as things like the 32X or the Virtual Boy. Let's take a look at some numbers. The only data available for Sega CD sales are estimates, and unfortunately they vary from as low as 1.5 million to 6 million, with most people sticking with 6 million for worldwide sales. So let's assume the worst for the Sega CD and say it only sold 1.5 million units. The 32X sold 655,000 units, the Virtual Boy sold 770,000 units, the Nintendo 64 disk drive sold only 15,000 units. The Philips CDI console sold 1 million units, and the Panasonic 3DO sold 2 million units. The TurboGrafx-16 console sold around 2.5 million units in the US, 10 million worldwide. So even at its worst, the Sega CD didn't do terribly. But calling a success wouldn't be prudent, as it definitely had problems, and as few as 5% of Mega Drive owners in continental Europe ever bought a Mega CD. It was certainly more popular in Japan and the US. The way I see it, the Sega CD had three main problems that kept it from becoming more popular. First, the secretive development cycle not only caused unnecessary hype in the US and the UK, but it kept third party developers out of the loop. While there are many examples of awesome, even genre defining first party games, in my opinion, it's really third-party games that let consoles stand the test of time. Sega did not have the resources and was not ready to carry such new technology on its own. Second, the Sega CD was developed at least a year too early. Had they waited until the Super Famicom was released, Sega could have gotten a better idea of what its abilities were and planned their add-on to meet or exceed its capabilities. While the 32X's release was terrible, its hardware concepts were sound. Had the Sega CD been released later, with even part of the 32X's hardware included, the video quality of the Sega CD would have been much better, and it could have handled more processor-intensive games. The Sega CD sorely needed this, because of the lack of specialty chips for Genesis cartridges. And finally, there's the price. The Sega CD debuted in America with a $300 price tag, and that was the lowest price the Model 1 went for, it was even more expensive in the UK and Japan. The fact that they redesigned the Genesis and Sega CD only a year later didn't help either, confusing consumers and retailers. Both models of the Genesis are compatible with both models of the Sega CD, but offering the redesigned, less expensive Sega CD up front would have been much better. So yes, I do think most of the Sega CD's problems could have been mitigated if Sega of Japan had not been so desperate. They jumped on the new technology bandwagon because they thought it would solve all of their problems. But if they had stepped back, taken a deep breath, and looked at the big picture, they would have seen that they were doing very well in the rest of the world. In fact, in June 1992, the Genesis controlled around 60% of the console market in the US, which was almost a year after the release of the Super Nintendo in America. The Genesis was seen as cooler than the Super Nintendo, its games were less censored, and it had a two-year head start to develop a loyal fan base. Speaking of censorship, it's impossible to do a comprehensive video on the Sega CD without mentioning it. It's not that the Sega CD introduced violence to video gaming, or that it had the most violent games. But when certain American politicians discovered the Sega CD game called Night Trap, they decided that this was the last straw and beginning in December 9, 1993, congressional hearings were held on the nature of violence in video games. Night Trap was a focus of these hearings, but it wasn't the sole reason for them. Mortal Kombat hit arcades in 1992, and even before that, Splatter House slashed onto the scene in 1989. Sega's American marketing kept it at odds with Nintendo, trying to show how cool older kids played Sega games and only little kids played Nintendo games. <laughs> 
Sega games were usually less censored than Nintendo games, so more games ended up on the Genesis with blood and gore, such as Mortal Kombat and Splatterhouse. Splatterhouse was not released on a Nintendo console while the series continued on the Genesis, and the Super Nintendo version of Mortal Kombat was heavily censored. So all the cool kids wanted the Genesis version, and everybody knew it. These hearings resulted in the creation of the ESRB, which is still in use today. Ironically, it was due in part to the creation of the ESRB that Nintendo could begin selling more mature titles on its consoles. The Super Nintendo would indeed have a few M-rated games, such as its Port of Doom and future Mortal Kombat games, which were censored to a lesser degree than the first game was. It was a few more years before CD games would come into their own. You didn't need 3D graphics to make good CD games, but the systems of the time simply didn't have the necessary horsepower to do more with all of that extra storage space. Of course, several creative people found ways to make it work back then, especially on home computers. But even for the games that were little more than regular 16-bit games with some CD audio and video slapped on, it was really cool to hear such high-quality music and to have animated or video cutscenes in games. And you can't dismiss the effect that voice acting can have on a game. While it was often of dubious quality, at the time even bad voice acting was exciting and new. As I said at the beginning, I had a Sega CD for a short time as a kid. I don't think we bought it new, but I honestly don't remember. I only got to play a few of the games at the time, and most of those I played by renting them. I don't know if I ever even really bought a Sega CD game, they weren't exactly cheap. I probably had the Sega CD for less than a year, because I made the hard decision to sell my Genesis, the Sega CD, and all of the games I had for them at our one and only yard sale in order to buy this, the PlayStation when it released in late 1995. But even in that narrow time frame, the Sega CD made its mark on my childhood. It was the Genesis with Redbook Audio, animated cutscenes, and voice acting. It updated several games I was familiar with and made them better, and it introduced me to genres I had never played before because we didn't get our first home computer until 1996. Well, I hope you've enjoyed this very lengthy trip back to the early 90s with me. Like I said, the Sega CD had over 140 games, and while most of them were nothing special, there was something for everyone. The Sega CD is, to date, the most successful console add-on ever produced, so it deserves a little respect. If you were around back then, I hope you learned something new, and if you weren't, I hope you'll give the Sega CD a second look when you come across it at thrift stores and flea markets. I know this was a very long video and that most people won't watch it all the way to the end, so if you're one of those few who did, thanks for sticking with me. As long as it was, I could have gone on. The early CD era of gaming is very interesting, whether you're talking about the console add-ons, home computers, or even the CDI and 3DO. For example, I said that Sega of America had to piece together their own prototype Sega CDs using non-functional units they had received. Since those so-called dummy units were never intended to be used, they did not contain proper CD-ROM drives, but instead had cheap audio CD drives. So when Sega of America tried using them to develop games, the drives spun much faster than they could handle, and several of their prototype units actually caught fire. Most of you have probably already seen this, but I'll end this video with the one thing I see and the one thing I hear when I hear the words Sega CD. Thanks for watching.